Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. My name is Mary. I'm talking into the wrong microphone. I'm just moving to the left right now. <laughs> Because I always do everything I'm told. Don't you? (laughs) Half of you do. (laughs) And I'm a very grateful member of the Worldwide Fellowship of Al-Anon. And I've been privileged to be part of Al-Anon for 26 years. Because Leo and I walked down the street to our first meetings the first night together. And I'm grateful that we've had the programs in both of our lives from that time. It is my birthday today. I'm very proud. I'm 55 years old. I think that's really great. I feel like I've arrived, finally. (laughs) So thank you. And I wonder where those 55 years went. You know, I even look back and I wonder where those 26 years went. And I, I feel so grateful that those 26 years were really such hard years, but good years and growing years. Um, I'm very nervous this morning. I don't know why I don't, I speak a lot and I shouldn't be nervous, but you know, my program has changed in the last few years and I don't quite get it yet. And so I'm probably nervous because I have no clue what's going to come out this morning. Leo would call that an an honesty attack. (laughs) So good luck to you. (laughs) When I was a little girl, probably four or five years old, I, uh, my family, had relatives, my father's sister, who lived on the banks of the Erie Canal in near Buffalo, New York. And we spent many, many summer Sundays there, and everyone drank beer, and everyone ate raw clams and threw the clamshells into the Erie Canal. And, you know, I was a little girl, and I was there as part of that, and that's what we did on Sundays. And as a little girl, I had a cousin who was just a few years older than me, and I just loved him. And uh, he, was, he was an important person in my life. He would let me play wiffle ball on his team while everyone else was telling me to get the heck out of the way. And one summer I was with him, very little girl, and we were playing across the street in the, the uh, neighborhood park in the sandbox. And we were building sandcastles. There was a child running around crazy, very like Leo, actually, when I, as I look back. And he was the neighborhood bully. And he kept running through that sandbox and running right through our castles and just ripping them up. And we were getting aggravated with that. So my cousin looked at me and he said, we're going to make a plan. I love this. So I was with him and and he said to me, this is what we're going to do. We're going to build a sandcastle and let him run through it. And we're going to build it again, let him run through it. But the third time he comes through it, we're each going to grab one of his legs We're going to bring him down. He's going to leave us alone. It was a good plan. So we built the sand castle. He turned off, came running through, tore it apart, built the sand castle. I'm getting excited. I'm itchy. You know, this is great. And he comes running through, and I'm ready. So I reach out, and I grab his leg. But my cousin is looking at me like, not yet. But I've got his leg, and I'm not letting go. And he ran around that park with this little girl attached to his leg. Over every stump, whatever, I was pretty beaten up, but I didn't let go. And if you didn't hear any more of my story, you'd know who I was. Because at 30, when I came into Al-Anon, I was still holding on and not letting go. The second little story I recall from my, actually, I don't recall it, I just learned about it not too long ago, was when I was about uh, three, my mother had a child. There were quite a few of us. My mother had us in pairs from the time she was 18 to the time she was 41. (laughs) There were kind of groups of kids. And um, I was in the middle group. And then she had this this baby. And the child was born Down syndrome. And she was told that he probably wouldn't live very long, but she chose to bring him home. And I don't remember any of this. You don't remember things that happened when you were three years old. But she did bring him home, and he lived with us for nine months in our home before he died. And that was a very sad time in our household, as you can imagine. And what I remember, what my part in that was that, you know, I was three years old, and I was happy. I didn't have a clue what was going on. And I know that as three years old, my mother loved me. She'd named, she'd given me a little nickname, Mimsy, 
which, you know, I am, I guess. And I could make everybody feel better in this sad household. I was not, I was the baby. I could make everybody feel better. And I did. And, you know, that's what I carried through life. I knew that my role was to make everybody feel better and feel happy. The perfect Al-Anon in the making. Won't let go and knows her role is to make everything better. There I was. I hadn't even gotten to five years old yet. I hadn't even been to school. And I was already perfectly formed. Well, I did go to school. And when I was in my junior year of high school... This freckle-faced, red-headed kid came by. And, you know, there he was. He was exciting. I was the honor society. Leo was not. <laughs> I was the orchestra. Leo was rock and roll. We were, like, meant for each other, you know? <laughs> if I hadn't met Leo... I would have met somebody just like Leo because we were just, we, that was not chance meeting. We just found each other. There is no one, by the way, just like Leo, so, which you'll see later on. But, so it would have been hard to find somebody just like him, but I would have come close because I was primed for that. And Leo fit into our family perfectly. We drank beer, he drank beer. You know, he was drinking it much younger than anyone else, but he was part of our household already at 16 and 17 years old. And our relationship, even then, moved around alcohol. And all of the notes and all of the little conversations were, you know, the love notes you pass when you're in high school and all of that. There was always that line that said, do you have to go out drinking with the boys this Saturday? Now, wouldn't that have been a clue about something? But no, I just ignored that. We even drew little cartoons. I remember little cartoons of of, you know, stick figures with bottles and everybody kind of happy. I found those notes a few years back when we were married, and I thought, what were you thinking? What were you thinking? Well, I wasn't thinking. I was feeling, and, you know, it felt right. So uh, there we were. And, and we had a relationship for the next few years. I went off to college. Leo went to Vietnam. And for the next few years, we just broke up and got back together and broke up and got back together and broke up and got back together Till finally I said, what the hell, I might as well marry him. I can't get rid of him. And Leo's told me since what you never want to tell an alcoholic is go because he's staying. So we did get married. And when I got married, I thought, I just knew. I just figured, well, what the heck? I can't, there's nothing else to do. It's not going to be good, but, you know. We'll just try it anyway. And as I was going down the aisle with my father, just, you know, just as we were heading down the aisle, I heard myself emit this incredible gasp, which made my father turn to me <laughs> and say, is everything all right? And I said, yep, I'm fine. And you know, I was fine for years after that. How's Leo? Fine. How are the kids? Fine. We're all fine. You know, our lives were falling apart. We were screaming and yelling and, and carrying on. We had no money. Our, our things were in disarray, but I was fine. I'd put on my little Mary Sunshine face and go out and tell the world that I was fine. Because what the heck was a nice girl like me doing in a place like that? So I had to be fine. I just had to be fine. So I was. When I came into the program and y'all told me what fine meant, you can guess if you don't know you know, letter by letter, what that meant, I was so surprised. But that was our marriage from the beginning. The drinking was present from the beginning. I'd grown up with some drinking, so, you know, that's just how it went. And I had no expectation that it was going to be any, it was going to be great. So there I was. Well, time passed, and I became a crazy person. You wouldn't expect that, would you? Those of you who are out there going, oh, really? <laughs> you know, it's hard to tell who was sicker. Dan said, you know, al didn't have the chemical dependency. We got crazy without it. Lucky us. And we didn't even have the fun. <laughs> so that's who I was. And I was a screamer and a yeller. And my poor little kids got my anger that I wasn't going to get Aim toward Leo, because Leo was not nice when he drank. 
And I knew that was coming right back at me. So all of the anger that I felt, which I couldn't reveal because nice girls don't have that. I was too fine to have real anger. So I stuffed it down and it would come out in all kinds of other ways. It would come out in headaches. It would come out in stomach problems. It would come out at my little children. And it wasn't, it wasn't real pretty. Somewhere in there, I, I sort of had the sense I needed to save myself. But, you know, I was into melancholy. I was really into melancholy. I wasn't just sad. I was melancholy. It was so more Frank Sinatra, you know. And I can remember standing at my kitchen window and looking out and feeling so sad. It was just sad. And thinking, whatever happened to the girl who used to laugh? Where is she? What happened to her? And not really knowing what was going on in our lives and denying that alcohol was the problem. You know, I'd see those Dick Van Dyke programs or I'd see those quizzes in women's magazines and I'd just slam those magazines shut and throw them away. I couldn't be looking at that stuff. So in my heart, I knew there was a problem, but I wasn't going to look at it because it was too big. And I wouldn't have had a clue what to do about that. But somewhere along the line, I, I felt I needed to save myself. And so um, the way I did that was to become a martyr. Didn't you? You know, that was where my self-esteem came from. I was so good. I just became gooder and gooder. And the badder Leo got, the gooder I became, you know? And I remember thinking that, you know, I took care of everything. I mowed the lawn. I paid the bills. I took out the garbage. I did it all because I just needed to send that message about I had this under control. I lived in the illusion that I had it under control. You know, I'd dole out $2 to Leo for a day, and he'd get drunk anyway. I don't know where the heck he got all his money, but, you know, I'd think, how the heck can you get drunk on $2? Well, you have your ways, I know. So, you know, I was trying, I had this illusion of control that I was living in, that I, somehow I had some, some way to keep this thing together. And so I did it by taking over every job. So basically what I was doing is I was taking over everything and sending the message to Leo, go ahead and drink, because I got this under control. That was the message. I never said it out loud, but that was the message. And I needed to do that because I needed to feel like I was someone or something. I didn't know that till much later in al -Anon. And I learned that martyrdom at my mother's feet. She was good, too. You know, I didn't, I didn't just figure that out on my own. But I learned it from my mother, and I, we were good at it. Now, did I ever want Leo out of my life? Oh, boy, did I ever. But, you know, I didn't want to kill him myself because nice girls don't do that. <laughs> so I was always hoping that something would befall him. You know, I never really articulated that in my mind what it was or that he would run off with someone and I could be the best woman at their wedding, you know, thinking maybe that would happen. But so I never really planned funerals. I never planned funerals. I just was always hoping there would be one. And I knew that at that funeral, I had this, I had this envision in my mind. There'd Leo would be laid out somehow, having something befalling him. He'd be laid out in the casket there, and I'd be standing in my drab navy blue blazer, because color, you know, we didn't have color in our lives. We wore navy blue, brown, dark green. I didn't know there was red. And I'd be standing next to the casket, and I'd be wearing my, my, my pins. I had envisioned this little pin, bar pin-like, with little charms hanging from it. There was a garbage can charm. There was a checkbook charm. There was a, there was a, uh, a lawnmower. And I'd stand there by the casket, and people would come by and look at Leo and say, wasn't she a good woman? <laughs> Later on, I also got a little, uh, I was speaking someplace, and I was talking, talking to them about the uh, wonders of sex in an alcoholic relationship. And um, remembering that, you know, I was a young woman, and uh, my body liked sex, even though I didn't like Leo. <laughs> and so, you know, he'd come home and we'd have this sexual relationship and Sister Mary Gregory would rise up from the bed and just hover there in the air while the dirty deed was going on down below. <laughs> and then when it was all over, I would retake my body, you know, and still maintaining my goodness. <laughs> and uh, somebody in the front row said to me, so what was the charm for that? 
And I said, well, it was a cowboy boot with a spur on it. <laughs> you know, I was pretending I was Miss Kitty or something to get through that. So that was the joy of our relationship back then. And some, somewhere along the line, I got a sense that the problem was Leo's drinking. And I think it was one of the first nights. He'd, we were, my sister was graduating from nursery school. She had... Um, some little kids, she was working part-time, she went back to school and she pulled off what an amazing feat, she'd gone back and gotten her, her nursing degree and we were supposed to go to a party. And Leo never came home that night, you know, his, his, his fanny hit a bar stool and he didn't have a choice. And so he came, he, he came home the next morning, actually. And I didn't go to that party. And I knew I should have gone to that party. And that was like my first inkling that, you know, you need to live a life here. You need, to, you need to find a way to get through the night. You need to sleep. You need to do some things. And those were the first times I was recognizing that I was getting lost in all of this. So when Leo came home the next morning, I said to him, you know, Leo, I think you have a drinking problem. I don't know where that was coming from. Well, I do know where that was coming from. And uh, I said, why don't you call AA? I didn't know where he would find the number for that. I had no clue. I don't know where that, that phrase came from. But he said, that's a good idea. Why don't you do that? <laughs> so I went, he was in bed. I went out in the kitchen and I dialed the phone and I called AA, found it in the phone book, called AA and said, you know, I have this friend who has this husband who has this problem. And they listened to me and they said, honey, when he's when he hits his bottom, he needs to make this call. And I said, okay, thank you very much. And I went back and got in bed. Never said a word about it again. But somehow I had identified for myself that there was, that was the problem. I didn't know what to do about it still, but now it was out in the open. Soon after that, I went back to work part-time. And Leo went on working a third shift or something, and... I didn't see his drinking quite as often. I'd leave for work in the morning, and he had his morning drinks, etc., and I wasn't there to see all that. And a few years passed, and one day, Leo said to me, he, he came home again in a, a blackout, I think, and once again I said, Leo, I think there's a problem with your drinking, and he said, yeah, I better call AA. And this time, I handed him the newspaper with, AA's number in it and walked away. And Leo made a call to AA. He didn't go to AA after that, but he made a call to AA. And all of a sudden he said to me, you know, Mary, let's go down to see our friends Tom and Terry. They had been, Tom was the best man at Leo's wedding. Leo was the best man at his wedding a few years, a few weeks later. And I wasn't too keen to see Tom because whenever Leo and Tom were together, the drinking was over the edge, and I was glad that we hadn't seen Tom and Terry in a while, and I was glad I wasn't that keen to go see them, but I had heard that Tom was sober, kind of through the neighborhood grapevine. So I went down reluctantly with Leo to Cowdersport, Pennsylvania, and that night Tom took Leo to his first AA meeting, and Teresa, his little Italian wife, Sicilian Billy, <laughs> took me into the kitchen and said, you know, you should go to Al-Anon because you have character defects, too. Well, <laughs> made me want to run out and find Al-Anon right away. <laughs> really, Teresa? I'm the good one. What character defects could I possibly have? I'm holding it all together. I'm the perfect person. So we came home from their house, and we found that there was an AA and Al-Anon meeting down the street at the end of our street at the church. And we walked down the street together, and Leo went upstairs to the AA meeting, and I went down to the little room where there were 12 people crowded into a small space, all smoking, and that was the al meeting. And the first night that I was at that meeting, somebody took me aside for my newcomer's meeting and told me about alcoholism and told me that alcoholism was something I, couldn't, I didn't cause, I couldn't cure, and I couldn't control. Now, I did believe that I caused Leo's drinking because I thought I didn't love him well enough. I thought there was something that I wasn't doing right 
The meals weren't good enough. I was yelling too much. I was too skinny. My Miss Kitty routine wasn't good enough. I don't know. But I was pretty sure I was part of the cause of his drinking. Of course, that's a little egocentric. But, you know, that's where I was. When you're a martyr, the world is revolving around you. But that first night when they said those things to me, it was as if a giant weight was lifted off my shoulders. And I believed that the first night. I know a lot of people struggle over and over with that for many years in Al-Anon, that they can't control it, and that they, can, they somehow can find the little switch to cure it. But that first night, I bought that, and I knew I was home, and for the first time, I talked to people about what was going on in our house. I never did before, because I was too fine. You know, I didn't tell anybody what was going on in our house. Of course, they saw Leo's car parked on the lawn, you know, I'm sure they noticed. I'm sure they noticed that I was the one out there trying to pull him out. We lived next to a church in our first apartment, and it seemed very important on Sunday morning that the parishioners did not see a drunken person slouched over the wheel of the car. It made much more sense to see a woman trying to pull a dead weight body <laughs> out of the car and up the stairs. You know, I did. I was a bar caller. Were you? I had, in fact, I, I had them listed on one page. I didn't have to bother looking them up. I just had them all listed on one page, and when Leo wouldn't come home, I would just flip to that page, and I'd start calling. And I was compulsive. I could not not call bars. And, you know, maybe the third bar in, when I'd ask, is Leo there, I'd hear down the bar, Leo, are you here? <laughs> and he'd say, no. And they'd get on the phone and say, nope, he's not here. And I'd say, well, thank you very much, and call the next bar. I mean, I was just compulsive. <laughs> One night, I recall, when um, I was very pregnant with our second baby, and Leo was out. It was late, late, late. And actually, it was morning. And he wasn't home yet. And I had um, a little infant, a little, one little guy in the crib, and this other one cooking. And the only car left home was this little Austin Healey Sprite convertible that we had. And it was parked out front. So I thought, I'm going out and finding him. That was the first time I ever did that. So I stuffed my body behind this wheel. It was not easy. And started this car up at 4 a.m. Now you can imagine what that sounded like in the neighborhood. It wasn't subtle. And I went out to find Leo leaving my other sleeping child in the house. The height of sanity. So I found Leo in a parking lot. And I went, well, there he is, and I drove home. <laughs> so effective, wasn't it? I didn't do that again, but that I guess I tell you those stories to just illustrate where I was. Just as crazy as a loon. So I came to Al-Anon, and I found home. And I found people around the table that were ha happy and laughing. And, you know, like I told you, I was into melancholy. I wasn't laughing, and they were. And so, even though the first night, because I was intellectually astute, I knew that I could do all those steps And you know, the first night. I read them, I understood them, sure, got it, next. But they would sit around the table and they would talk about the slogans, you know? And I would think, oh my God, these slogans are so trite. I was so arrogant. I was a mess, but I was arrogant. But they were laughing and I wasn't. And, you know, God had been out of my life for quite a long time because actually I was very angry with God. I was very irritated. I didn't even know that. But I felt, what was it? if God had loved me, why would I be in that mess? I did all the right things. I went to a Catholic college. I let the nuns abuse me. You know, I deserved better. And here I was. So I didn't know that I was that angry with God. All I knew was that God was out of my life, and if, he, if there was a God at all, he had nothing to do with me. But I'd sit around the table with these laughing people, and they'd say to me, Mary, if you just turn your will over to God every day, give him, give him your life, things will get better. And I'd think, oh, my God, what are they saying? But then they were laughing, you know. So I went home, and I remember that very first morning. And I said, God, if you're up there, and I don't believe you are, by the way. 
Here's my day. Have a shot at it. And you know, the most amazing thing was the God of my understanding reached down and touched me. And my days got better. Now, Leo was in the program. By this time, I think we were in the program a year. And Leo was getting better. He wasn't drinking. But I was still nuts. And I was still so unhappy. And now I couldn't point my finger at the drinking because it was gone. And I, there was still something really wrong with me. I couldn't live a life. I didn't know how. You know, I'd spent all my, all my time was worrying. People would say, Mary, you want to go to the movies? I'd say, no, i I got to stay home and worry. <laughs> and I have my worrying quota in today, you know? And I was stood at windows watching, waiting for Leo to come home, waiting, waiting, waiting. I didn't have time to do anything constructive. I was tied up. So when I came into the program, I didn't know how to live life. I had stopped living life. I had stopped driving in the car. The only thing I managed to do was get to work, and I bet you I was suspected as heck there. So I had to relearn how to live in Al-Anon. And my first slogan was, live and let live. And I worked that slogan like, live and let live. And I, I, needed to, I needed to try things. I needed to do things. I remember thinking, you know, I'm staying home. I'm not going. I was overly responsible, could you tell? That was my role in, in the family. And I, I said, I'm not going to work. I'm going to see if I can stay home and read in bed all day. That was one of the little goals I set for myself. <laughs> well, I got to about noon, and I just couldn't stand it anymore. I said, wow, wouldn't it be something if you went to the movies in the middle of the day? I never did do that one. My sponsor said to me, why don't you try crafts? That helped her. I said, like what? She said, well, make an afghan. And I said, oh, my God, an afghan? It's like this big. I made a potholder. <laughs> and I said, whoa, are you good? You know? I set little trips for myself. I'd say, okay, you're going to get back in the car and you're going to start driving places. And one of the places was to drive down and get my own license renewed because I'd stopped doing that. You know, all the fears and all the anxieties and all the stuff that I hadn't admitted that I was living with when I was living with active alcoholism and my own fears that I'd just brought with me were there. And now I had to deal with them. So I'd set my little, my little small steps. And I'd drive to my, my sister-in-law's house and I'd say, near Boston, I'd say, okay, I'm gonna, this is my plan. I'm gonna drive into Boston to see my friend. And the morning would come when I was gonna do that and I'd lay in bed thinking, no, you don't really have to do that. That's silly. But you know, that little voice in the back of my head would say, do it. it was my Al-Anon friend, my little Al-Anon voices in the back of my head, do it. And I'd get in the car and I'd make my trip. One night I was home, and, and Leo was working third shift, and when he got sober, he slept as much as he ever drank. And I didn't know that was part of recovery. I didn't know that was his body renewing itself. I didn't know that he was suffering anxiety, too, and getting out of bed was huge. So I, I would just, now I was, instead of waiting on the phone or waiting at the window, I was waiting at the end of the bed for life to begin, <laughs> you know? And I would have to say to myself, okay, if Leo weren't here... If he was dead, if he didn't exist, what would I do today? And I would say, I would take the kids to the zoo, pack a little picnic lunch, and off I'd go. And the only way I could detach from Leo's being in bed or anything about Leo was to pretend he didn't exist because I could not cut whatever those invisible threads that held me to him were. If he was up, I was up. If he was down, I was down. If he was in bed, I was waiting. I had no life, and I didn't, know how to, I didn't know how to sever all that. But you told me how to do that. And you said, get in the car. You told me to detach with love. I got to that later. And you told me to go live my life because you said, live and let live. I was a high school French teacher back then. I'd never been to France because I was too afraid to go, honestly, before I had anything to do with Leo. And that first year in the program, I took my students to France. And that was a gift that you gave me. Life opened up. You said, you can do this. You, can, you said to me, this is your life. It's no dress rehearsal. You're not getting another shot. Go live it. You told me that. What a gift. I never knew that. Or if I knew it, I didn't know how. 
So, life opened up, and I, after I went to Paris, I just never looked back. And you showed me service. And, you know, I was in a little group that, that was involved in service, so I got to really drag you there, right? Any of us who are in service know that? No one asks. They just they get in the car. And I got involved in Al-Anon service, and I needed service more than service needed me because I needed a place to put my energies, and I needed a place to find out who I was. And as Billy said last night, if you want to, if you want to have your character defects taken care of, and I had plenty, get into service. Because there's always, there's always someone there who will help you with your inventory in a loud way in a room full of people. And so I did the service thing, and for the next 15 years, I was involved in Al-Anon service at the local level and at the state level and at the doing conventions. And I mean, it was just a huge part of my life. There was my job, and then there was Al-Anon, and there was my family. But Al-Anon was the biggest thing, and I've had a love affair with Al-Anon. So I got involved in service, and I was privileged also to be the delegate for my area. And Leo was the AA delegate the same time I was an Al-Anon delegate. We got a lot of mail at our house. I think that postman quit. <laughs> you know, he just delivered these bundles of things. But it was all growth, and it was all learning who we were, and it was all learning how to give something of ourselves that we hadn't done before. And in the meantime, we needed to find God in our lives. Now, I did not accept God very readily in my life, as you can tell. Because when you're in control, you don't need him. Sometimes he even gets in your way. And so I had anguish about finding God, and I'd try to take a step forward, and I'd pull back, and I'd take a step forward and pull back, and I couldn't put it with religion at all. Until one night at my meeting, somebody said, just go to church, take what you like, and leave the rest. I never remember any priest saying that to me in the Catholic Church, that I could take what I liked and leave the rest. So I didn't go to a Catholic Church. <laughs> I went someplace else, but I found what I needed. And I was able op to open up to the God of my understanding and ultimately the God of my childhood. But it wasn't easy. And I recall the struggle I had with giving up, and that's when I discovered the anger that I had, that I didn't know. Now, this is way into the program, several years into the program. And I was painting my son's bedroom. I painted it navy blue for some reason. <laughs> it seemed like a good idea at the time. And decided to change it back to beige. And just to save time and money, I thought, well, I won't prime it. I'll just go up there and paint it. So I painted it every day for like a week because <laughs> that's what you do, you know. So every morning I would go up there before I did anything else and paint this room. And while I was up there painting one day and having my, having my struggle with God, having my conversation with God, I found myself rolling the paint on and swearing out loud. I swore at God. And I said, where were you? And I thought, who said that? I looked around. Actually, I really swore at God. I didn't just say, where were you? But I'm trying to take that swearing out of my leave, you know, because <laughs> I want to be fine again. <laughs> and that, that was the first time I realized that I had separated myself from God. And it reminds me of the story of the couple that's riding in their car and it's, um, you know, 25th wedding anniversary, and, and she says to him, remember when we used to sit close together and drive? That was before seatbelts, obviously. And he looked at her and he said, yeah, who moved? Well, that was me and God. Who moved? God was there all the time, but I moved. And so after that anger came out, I had this peace. I just had peace. And then God has never left my life since then. And I've been able to find expression with God in ways I never could have imagined. And I've been able to be part of a religious tradition. And I, I just, you know, it's still take what you like and leave the rest because you gave me that. But there's no anger, there's no struggle, there's no feeling that somehow I'd been left behind again. And so I had this lifetime, this, this wonderful lifetime of recovery, about five years into recovery, Leo still had a lot of anger. I had enough health in Al-Anon finally to say, I don't want to do this anymore. And after five years of recovery for both of us, we took one look at each other and said, who the heck are you? Because we weren't the same people we were coming into this program. We were both getting healthy, and we didn't know what that other person was like. So I said to Leo, I think you should leave. Now remember, the first time I said that, did he go? No. So here I was saying it again. 
So I think we had a one-week split. Leo was home every day during that time. But his sponsor said to him, you know, Leo, if you want to fix your marriage, AA's not going to do that. That's not what AA's about. And Al-Anon is not about fixing your marriage. Al-Anon is about fixing you. If you want to get your marriage fixed, go to some place that somebody who knows how to do that. And so ultimately we did, and ultimately we were able to live together again and learn how to live together again healthy. You know, we lived a roller coaster life. It was fun. It was negative fun, but it was exciting, right? You're up, you're down, you're all over the place. Oh my gosh, your emotions are running high all the time. You get healthy and all of a sudden it's like smoothed out and you don't know how to live that. I didn't know how to live that way. I had to learn that all over again. I had to find out what what made you exciting, what made life exciting but was still healthy. We didn't know how to do that. You know, a fight was always what got things going before. So we relearned that and you helped us with that. And service helped us with that. And we learned how to get powerless with each other and with a lot of other things in our lives. And so we had a we, we had a good good AA Al-Anon marriage, I guess, both working and living our own programs. And I was in the program about 20 years. And I'd done all the wonderful service things. And uh, I decided, well, you know, my kids are older. I'm going to really expand my job. And so I changed jobs, and I took on a job with a lot more responsibility. And I was in that job for a few months, and... Uh, I come home one day, my, my boss put me on this big state project, very high visibility project. I was, I was learning how to do it. There was a lot of stress for me. And we got a phone call one day. And the phone call was that my sister and my pair, who was three years older than I am, had been killed in a plane crash with her husband. And I was just blown over. She was 48 years old. I was just blown over by that. And I didn't know what to do with it. But you know, this, what, what, what we do, what I do, I bet you some of you do it, is we just go on. We say, okay, yep, okay, move on. Well, a week after that, my mother, who was starting to fail, was in her car, rolled it over, hit a phone, telephone pole, and we, Leo and I had gone off to our, to the lake to try to relax a little, and we got a call from our son saying, Grandma just rolled her car over. So we zipped back home, and of course, this is my mother. She's rolled this car over. The, the policeman comes to the car, looks at her and says, we're going to take you to the hospital. And she says, oh, no, I'm fine. <laughs> so they put her in the hospital. She had a pacemaker put in, and that was, I think, August. In October, Leo's mother was diagnosed with lung cancer that was going to be terminal. I'm in this job. I have all these things happening. Our dog died. And it was just like, what is going on here? What is going on here? But, you know, I just kept going because that's what I do. I just keep going. And then during that time, I had a chance. It was like three years later. I had a chance for another job, another um, uh, growth, another bigger responsibility job. And I took that. And I was on that job. And my mother died the first month I was in my job. In between those years, I'd put my mother in a nursing facility, which was the most traumatic thing in my adult life. And I saw I had this five-year span where it just seemed like life was upside down. But I just kept going. I just kept going. I was the achiever. You know, I was going to make it all right. I kept putting it all together. I was good at that. And all of a sudden, I just couldn't get my head up off the pillow in the morning. I couldn't get to work. I couldn't, I couldn't go. And so I did something I'd never, I'd go to meetings. I was going to my meetings. I couldn't seem to find anything. I couldn't hear anything. And somebody was passing a book. I just felt like a failure. I, I felt depressed. I felt like I wasn't doing anything right. And somebody was passing around a book at the meeting. It was the Al-Anon Survival to Recovery book. And in that book, there are 20 questions about, did you grow up with a problem drinking or drinking in your home? And I'm looking down the list of questions and I'm, I'm saying yes, 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 yes to all these questions. And I'd read that book. I didn't identify with one thing in that book. I couldn't find myself in that book. And I kept saying, why am I still looking at this? Why am I still saying yes here? So I thought, well, you know, I have to do something different here because I need to be able to, 
to get my head up off this pillow. I would wake in the morning with such huge anxiety I could I couldn't stand it. It felt like I was being covered by a black pit, falling into a black pit. It would just take over my body. And so I went to a therapist. And so I'm sitting in the therapist's office, blabbing like, because I was nuts. (laughs) And he he said, shut up. (laughs) You know, if you want my help, shut up. And during the time I met with him, he said, you know, your spirit's dying. You need to find out. You need to go back and find out your roots. And I think, what the heck does he want with me? I've been in Allen on 20 years. I've I've worked through the problems with my husband. I've gone back and looked at my relationship with my mother. I thought I'd done the thing with my dad. And I thought, what does he want from me? I'd leave there so mad. But he kept pushing me on that. And the only way I knew how to f- figure anything out was to go back to my Al-Anon. So I picked up that same book, Survival to Recovery. But this time, when I looked at that book, I didn't try to find myself in the book. I did what you all talk about. You know, don't compare, identify. And this time I underlined every feeling in that book. And I understood that everything I had brought into my alcoholic marriage was part of my childhood. And I understood that that little girl who was trying to make everybody happy was a huge part of that. And I found out that I was the achiever and trying to do good all the time and be good because I was trying to hold up the family banner. I was going to make us okay. My father was sick many times when I was young. He had tuberculosis, and he was away in a sanitarium a lot of the time. There wasn't a lot of money. My mother was, as I told you, a martyr. She was also, we don't go there, we don't do this. And yet I had these, I had these visions of grandeur. I was going to college. I wasn't going to any college. I was going to pick Vassar. You know, we didn't have... My father couldn't fill out financial forms. I'll change the way I was going to say that because he had nothing to write down on him, you know, and I was angry about that. I didn't understand that. And I looked at this guy and I said, why didn't I know this? And he said, well, in the fellowships of Al-Anon and AA, they would call that denial. You know, I I think this is probably a midlife thing. I don't know. But I had this strong desire to just get rid of it all, to just get rid of it all and to start over and to be fresh. And so I said, Leo, why don't we move? Now, moving is a really good thing when you're in this place because moving puts no stress on you at all. So we sold this beautiful home. Leo was not wanting to do that. He was great because he was with me all the time. And we, I just threw away half my life. We're up in the attic trying to get rid of this stuff. I felt this huge burden of stuff. And I just was throwing everything out, just throwing it out. Leo took his stand on his bowling ball. We took that, even though we hadn't used it in 20 years. Huge, huge argument about that. But I just cleared it all out. And we moved to a, a little townhouse with tons of light, windows everywhere. I kept saying, I need another window. I need a skylight. I had this huge need for light. And I understand that now as a symbolic kind of thing. I needed to let the light in. I needed to dispel all the fear and anxiety and chunk that I'd accumulated over a lifetime. And so we moved to this townhouse, and you know, the walls were white, and you know what? I didn't put a thing up on the wall for over a year. And I I quit every organization I was in. I stopped going to Al-Anon meetings. I went to work. I went to church. And I knit. And you know what? I took about a year and a half to do that, and it was like I just came into myself and got quiet and healed, and just healed. Now, I don't recommend not going to Al-Anon for that long, but, you know, after 20-some years, I had a lot of good programs. After a year or so had passed, and I started to feel better, and I started to come out of the depression, and I started to feel like living a little bit again, because I didn't want to do anything, didn't care, classic depression sy- sy- symptoms, you know. But I took that time, and I had, I, you gave me permission it until you have a total breakdown. But you gave me permission to go get what I needed. You gave me permission to go heal. About a year and a half after that, however, I started to see at work some of my little character defects creeping back in. You know, you can do it for a little while, but I can't do it for a long time. 
and I had to find a new Al-Anon meeting. And so I went back to, found a little group in the new town that we lived in. And, you know, I need that meeting still. I need that meeting just to keep me aware and just to keep me level. And just to remind me that, you know, I'm me wherever I go. But I can keep some of those things in check as long as I stay close to you. So that's what I did. And that's only been a few years. And I just was thinking how wonderful it is the last, oh, I don't know, the last six months, I've been waking up every day happy. I feel like it's a renewal. I feel like you gave me a second recovery. You gave me two recoveries. And I'm so grateful for that. You know, when I was a, a, a young girl, we used to have to iron clothes. My mother ironed my father's white shirt. I think people are still doing that again now that, you know, it's like natural fibers. We should never have let that happen to us. But my mother would iron these shirts and she'd sprinkle them and she'd roll them up in little sausages and she'd put them in a peach basket with a vinyl liner and they'd cook in there or something. I don't know. Little jokes. You know, when they were just right, you'd take them out and they were ready to be ironed. And when you looked at that shirt and you first pulled them out, they were unbelievably wrinkled. And that was my life before I came to Al-Anon. And you know, the way I tried to get those wrinkles out then was to just push at them with the sheer force of my will, trying to get those wrinkles out. You said to me, why don't you take step three? Buy an iron. Oh. Now I had this iron. I'd go over those shirts. A lot better. And then I was in a little longer, and you said to me, why don't you take step 11? Plug it in. (laughs) And you know, if you keep that iron plugged in every day, because you have to plug it in every day, you plug into that source of love and energy, and you wrinkle out the wrinkles in those shirts, and life goes smoother. And if you start getting down the ironing board a little too far and that plug pulls out, it just doesn't work as well. If I stay out of my way, and if I let God be in charge of my program and my life, life is good. And even in the bad times, I mean, life's life. Life happens, death happens. It just happens. To your higher power, it works out in the end. I like to envision myself with my higher power like we're in a boat. We're out on a little lake, Atwood Lake. Why the heck not? And in my boat, I'm rowing, I'm rowing. God's at the tiller, setting the direction, moving us around. We're going every place we need to go. And then I say, excuse me, God, could, uh, could I take the tiller? And God says, okie dokie, because that's what he does. And so God moves up, I take the tiller, and we go in circles. We just go in circles. And you know why that is? It's because God don't roll. (laughs) So if I keep myself rolling like crazy and let God take the tiller, life is good. I can't thank you enough for what you've given me in my life. I love this program. I love the AA program. I love the principles, principles of powerlessness and forgiveness and sharing. And sometimes I think, why the heck do we do this? Why do we stand in, in a room like this and tell us, tell people we don't even really know the deepest, most intimate things about our life? And you know why that is? Because somehow, when we all do that together, we heal. We just heal. And I feel healed. Hallelujah. I love you all. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.